The facilities of this station for the next hour have been engaged by the Reverend Charles E. Coghlan, who will speak over a nationwide hookup of stations from his pulpit at Royal Oaks, Michigan. At this time, station WMCA wishes to reiterate its position that the views expressed by Father Coghlan on these broadcasts are his own and do not necessarily reflect the views of the station. This afternoon, Father Coughlin will discuss one of the most vital and burning questions of our day. The question of the Jew, and of the Christian, and of persecution. Hundreds of thousands in this audience will desire to have a permanent copy of this memorable address. It will be printed in full only by Father Coughlin. He will be glad to distribute to all those who write to him a copy of this address, either in pamphlet form or a copy of Social Justice magazine, whose editors plan to carry this speech in full. Undoubtedly, it will occasion considerable controversy, but undoubtedly it will do much to clarify a vexed problem in our midst. After Father Coughlin delivers his address, the Little Flower Choristers, directed by Emil Cote of New York, and there transcribed, will sing for you, What Could Jesus Do More? Mr. Cyril Guthrell is at the console of the Shrine Organ. Following this musical rendition, Father Coughlin will again appear before the microphone in his prayer and thought for the week. Be it known that this broadcast is in no wise donated. Its expenses are met by the contributions of this audience who desire to retain Father Coughlin on the air. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to present Father Coughlin in his address entitled Persecution, Jewish and Christian. Good afternoon, my friends. <clears throat> At long last, a calloused world has come in personal contact with a persecution which it understands. At long last, it appears that the better sympathies of an indifferent citizenry are aroused to protest against the mad injustices now being meted out to a minority people resident abroad. This afternoon, bear with me while I add my voice in protest against persecution, that murderous weapon of hatred. Bear with me while I endeavor to trace to its lair the fanged serpent of hatred whose sting has struck once again to spew poison and deal out death over the face of the earth. A fanged serpent which on every previous occasion has been successful in beating a slimy retreat to rest in security until appropriate conditions summoned it to emerge and repeat its devastation. This time, a united world must shatter the cruel weapon of their persecution. This time, we must assault hatred, so that never again will it lift its head to assault us. Thus, I shall ask an intelligent audience composed of intelligent Christians and intelligent Jews, why is there persecution in Germany today? How can we destroy it? <coughs> 
Before attempting to answer these questions, permit me to review for the uninformed members of this audience the chief incidents immediately preceding the latest manifestation of persecution suffered by thousands of innocent Jews, natives of Germany. A persecution which, fortunately for all, has received a superabundance of publicity both at home and abroad. A few days ago, a young Polish Jew fired a shot that was heard round the world. Because his Polish Jewish parents were dismissed from Germany by an order issued by the Nazi government, expelling all foreign born Jews from the Reich, this frenzied youth murdered a German public official in Paris. Reprisals for this imprudent act were rapid on the part of the Hitler government. Peculiar reprisals. Instead of demanding an eye for an eye or a tooth for a tooth, the German government levied a fine of approximately $400 million against the 600,000 German Jews resident in Germany. Following this, the American newspapers were aglow with headlines. Our public officials were loud in their denunciations. Our ecclesiastical leaders were quick to disapprove of this vengeance. Our presidents spurred on the nation's sympathetic emotions by saying, I myself could scarcely believe that such things could occur in a 20th century civilization. Now, to be effectual in our discussion, which is not content merely with offering sympathy for the innocent German Jews, not content with registering protests against the German government, to be effectual in our discussion, which aims at unveiling the cause of persecution and then of destroying it, it is necessary to record the following facts. Although cruel persecution to German-born Jews has been notorious since 1933, particularly in the loss of their citizenship, nevertheless, until last week, the Nazi purge was concerned chiefly with foreign-born Jews. German citizen Jews were not molested officially in the conduct of their business. The property of German citizen Jews was not confiscated by the government, although a few synagogues and stores were destroyed by mob violence. The children of German citizen Jews were permitted to attend public schools with other children. The German citizen Jewish bankers pursued their business as usual. The German citizen rabbis were permitted the practice of their rights, although recently some of their synagogues have been raised. Until this hour, however, no German citizen Jew has been martyred for his religion by government order, although restrictions were placed upon Jewish professional men. <laughs> While it is true that foreign citizen Jews resident in Germany were disparaged, were expelled, it is likewise true that many social impediments were placed in the pathway of Catholics and Protestants by the Nazi government impediments which are revolting to our American concepts of liberty. But despite all this, official Germany has not yet resorted to the guillotine, to the machine gun, to the kerosene-drenched pit as instruments of reprisal against Jew or Gentile. My friends, it is only natural, however, that the civilized world was shocked at the turn of recent events at the imposition of a tremendous fine levied against innocent German Jews because a Polish Jew murdered a German government official. It is only natural that the Jews resident in America are aroused because they're co-nationals and co-religionists living under the jurisdiction of Chancellor Hitler have been subjected to such an unreasonable reprisal. It is likewise natural that Christians in every nation particularly in our own, condemn this unjust persecution not only because it is unchristian, but because it is unwise. In all countries, Jews are in the minority. They have no nation of their own. They have no flag. The World Almanac states that there are only 15 million Jews in all the world, and only 4 million resident in North America. Certainly they are in the minority, but a closely woven minority in their racial tendencies, 
a powerful minority in their influence, a minority endowed with an aggressiveness, an initiative, which despite all obstacles has carried their sons to the pinnacle of success in journalism, in radio, in finance, in all the sciences and arts. Thus with these facilities at their disposal, no story of persecution was ever told one half so well, one half so thoroughly, as the story of this $400 million reprisal which culminated a series of persecutions. Perhaps, may I resubmit, this is attributable to the fact that Jews, through their native ability, have risen to such high places in radio and in press and in finance. Perhaps this persecution is only the coincidental last straw which has broken the back of this generation's patience. Whatever be the reason of this unparalleled publicity, we are all thankful to God that it has happened, for it gives both Jew and Gentile, Christian and non-Christian, an opportunity to write a new precedent, to establish a new tradition, a precedent and tradition by which we will all unite with all our facilities for all time to oppose all persecution wherever it may originate. The Jew has challenged the Christian for his sympathy and cooperation. In turn, the Christian challenges the Jew for his. Thus, in a spirit of mutual cooperation, in a scientific spirit of coldly facing causes in order to remove effects, let us pause to inquire why Nazism is so hostile to Jewry in particular and how the Nazi policy of persecution can be liquidated. It is the belief, be it well or ill-founded, of the present German government, not mine, that Jews, not as religionists, but as nationals only, were responsible for the economic and social ills suffered by the fatherland since the signing of the Treaty of Versailles. Imbued with this idea, be it right or wrong, an idea that spread rapidly, particularly since 1923, when communism was beginning to make substantial advances throughout Germany, a group of rebel Germans under the leadership of an Austrian-born war veteran, Adolf Hitler by name, organized for two purposes. First, to overthrow the existing German government under whose jurisdiction communism was waxing strong. And second, to rid the fatherland of communists whose leaders, unfortunately, they identified with the Jewish race. Thus, Nazism was conceived as a political defense mechanism against communism and was ushered into existence as a result of communism. And communism itself was regarded by the rising generation of Germans as a product not of Russia, but of a group of Jews who dominated the destinies of Russia. Did these Germans have facts, as they said, to substantiate this belief? in the minds of the Nazi party. Official information emanating from Russia itself informed the world that communism, while barbarously opposed to every form of Christianity, made it a crime for any comrade to utter a single word of reproach against the Jews. Uncontradictable evidence gleaned from the writings and the policies of Lenin proved indisputably that the government of the Soviet Republic was predominantly anti-Christian and definitely anti-national. More than that, the 1917 list of those who, with Lenin, ruled many of the activities of the Soviet Republic disclosed that of the 25 quasi-cabinet members, 24 of them were atheistic Jews, whose names I have before me, published by Nazis and distributed throughout Germany. This list, a German list and not mine, will be published in a pamphlet which I will gladly distribute to all who request a copy of this address. But be it emphasized 
that these Jews were not religious Jews. They were the haters of God, the haters of religion. Thus, throughout Germany, antipathy towards all Jews grew rapidly. It was increased year by year, and particularly in 1935, when the official disclosure made manifest that the Central Committee of the Communist Party operating in Russia consisted of 59 members, among whom were 56 Jews, and that the three remaining non-Jews were married to Jewesses. The litany of these names too long to read to a radio audience also will be printed in a pamphlet for distribution to all who request it. I speak these words certainly holding no brief for Germany or for Nazism. Simply as a student of history, I am endeavoring to analyze the reason for the growth of the idea in the minds of the Nazi party that communism and Judaism were too closely woven for the national health of Germany. Nor do I speak these words to defend the atheistic international Jews and Gentiles throughout the world who follow the footsteps of Lenin and advocate the principles of Marx. I do ask, however, that an insane world will distinguish between the innocent Jew and the guilty Jew, as much as I would ask the same insane world to distinguish between the innocent Gentile and the guilty Gentile. Believe me, my friends, it is in all charity that I speak these words as I seek to discover the causes that produced the effect known as Nazism. Nazism which was evolved to act as a defense mechanism against the incursions of communism. Let us not forget the object of this discussion. My purpose is to contribute a worthwhile suggestion to eradicate from this world its mania for persecution. Thus, while we are concerned with destroying the causes which beget persecution from this civilization of ours, let us profit at this occasion when the attention of our country has been called to this international immorality, particularly on the occasion of a $400 million fine being levied against 600,000 Jews. I ask you, should not all good men Jew and Gentile, Catholic and Protestant, Christian and non-Christian, should not all good men coordinate their forces to restore sanity, peace, and justice to an era which, for its ferocity, its barbarism, and its hatred, has outstripped the Diocletians, the Neros, and the Torquemadas of old. I was thrilled to hear the most intellectual Archbishop of San Francisco remind his compatriots that this universal surge of sympathy whose waters are now about to wash clean the impure emotions of a materialistic America, I was thrilled, and so were you, to hear him state that at long last the press and the radio of this nation are beginning to play their part in arousing a dormant people to the other injustices and persecutions which are besmirching our civilization, the persecutions in Russia, in Mexico, and in Spain. Persecution is an injustice wherever it exists. Today's persecution was born from the loins of yesterday's persecution. Thus, if Nazism, a persecutor of Jew and Catholic and Protestant, if Nazism is a defense mechanism against communism, be assured that communism, another persecutor, was a defense mechanism against the greed of the money changers who persecuted and pilloried the teeming populations of Europe. Permit me to restate that important principle. If Nazism is now memorable for its injustice and its persecution, so was communism, and so was the economic system which made slaves of millions in the midst of plenty the system which generated communism. Thus, one persecution begets another, 
as one injustice evolves into another. The inevitability of cause and effect will pursue its course to its logical destiny of chaos as one injustice continues to reproduce a worse injustice. It is our concern, therefore, to destroy the cause in order to prevent a succession of disastrous effects. To abolish prosecution, let us destroy hatred. To eliminate hatred, let us establish justice. Justice for all, for all without exception. Any other approach to our problem is unscientific. And may I add, there can be no justice without God. There can be no God without love. Love for him and for our fellow men, whom he fashioned according to his image and likeness. Be not mistaken, therefore, in analyzing the cause of Nazism. Trace it courageously to its legitimate lair, to its occasioning cause. Therefore, I say to the good Jews of America, be not indulgent with the irreligious atheistic Jews and Gentiles who promote the cause of persecution in the land of the communists. The same ones who promote the cause of atheism in America. Be not lenient with your high financiers and politicians who assisted at the birth of the only political, social, and economic system in all civilization that adopted atheism as its religion, internationalism as its patriotism, and slavery as its liberty. In our possession, we have a copy of the official white paper issued by the English War Cabinet in 1919. This official paper prints the names of the Jewish bankers Kuhn Loeb and Company of New York among those who helped to finance the Russian Revolution and Communism. Since then, both Jewish and Gentile financiers have been according financial comfort to the Soviet Republic. Perhaps these financial overtures were made in innocence. Perhaps not. Moreover, I have before me a quotation from the periodical named the American Hebrew of September 10, 1920, which says, quotations, the achievement, the Russian Jewish revolution, destined to figure in history as the overshadowing result of the world war, was largely the outcome of Jewish thinking, of Jewish discontent, of Jewish effort to reconstruct, unquote. Let our remarks be couched in the language of charity when referring to that quotation. It was a Jewish effort to reconstruct. But in justice, we expect that results, that truth founded upon fact and experience, now will convince all Jewish leaders worthy of the name to repudiate vigorously atheistic communism and its followers when submerges the fanged serpent of persecution. Then and only then can we coordinate our forces to banish hatred and injustice from the nations of the world. Now that experience has proven that this effort to reconstruct society by means of communism died a borning, now that the same experience teaches us that from the birth cradle of communism there rose the stench of Nazi persecution, now that this communism is per permeating the entire world with the fumes of hate, of destruction, and of irreligion, is it not time for those Jews and Christians who have escaped unscathed to repurify the atmosphere of the world first from communism, lest by its continued presence an unjust defense mechanism similar to Nazism will spring up to assail us? Thus it is my hope that the thousands of erudite, sincere Jews in this nation, together with all informed Christians, will recognize that as long as misguided Jews and Gentiles both 
and in such great numbers, continue to propagate the doctrines of anti-God, anti-Christ, anti-patriotism, and anti-property, so long there will always exist some defensive mechanism against communism. Today, it is Nazism in Berlin. Tomorrow, tomorrow, it will be some otherism in New York. But always, it will be characterized by persecution. It would be ignominious for Christians at this hour to cloak themselves in the garments of class silence on the subject of Nazism or communism, the latter from which cesspool there originated Nazism. And it would be ignoble for us to raise our voice in defense of persecution and not to raise our voice to defend the 600,000 Jews of Germany. However, it is my opinion that Nazism, the effect of communism, cannot be liquidated in its persecution complex until the religious Jews in high places, in synagogue and finance, radio and press, attack the cause, attack it forthright, and the errors and the spread of communism together with all our co-nationals who support it. My fellow citizens, I am not ignorant of Jewish history. I know its glories. I am acquainted with its glorious sons. I am aware of the keen intellectuality which has characterized its progress in commerce, in finance, in all the arts and sciences, and particularly in the field of communication. But I am also aware that every nation from time immemorial has lifted in its hand the lash of persecution to strike the back of Jewry. From Nineveh to Berlin, from ancient to modern times, a constant moan of suffering has been raised from the weeping wall whose structure now has encompassed the entire world. Portugal and Spain, France and Germany, England and the northern countries, Italy and Russia, all in turn have taken their stand at the pillar of persecution to wield the leaden lash about the shoulders of Jews. For what reason, I need not detail at this moment. I will satisfy myself simply by drawing to your attention that since the time of Christ, Jewish persecution only followed, only followed after Christians were first persecuted persecuted either by exploiters within their own ranks, as in the Middle Ages, or by the enemies from without, as in our own day. Many historians, in fact a vast majority of them, maintain that the Jews were persecuted because of their social philosophy.
On page 1019, it states, quotations, Mr. Schiff has always used his wealth and his influence in the best interests of his people. He financed the enemies of autocratic Russia and used his financial influence to keep Russia from the money market of the United States, unquote. Surely these are reputable sources of information which I present to refute Mr. Kerensky, who said, quotation, the revolutionary government obtained credits not through any bankers, Jewish or Gentile, in America, but from the United States government, unquote. I am not mistaken in my previous contention unless Mr. Jacob Schiff assumes to be identical with the American government. Ladies and gentlemen, the Alexander Kerensky abortive revolution was a failure. Possibly, I repeat, because it was not managed by the revolutionary atheistic Jews, although it was financed by Mr. Jacob Schiff, the senior partner of the Kuhn, Loeb and Company. Let us now turn our attention momentarily to the second Russian Revolution, which began in the autumn of 1917. Mr. Leon Trotsky was one of its prime movers. He was a successful revolutionary. Now an exile in neighboring Mexico, this witness was persuaded to enter the lists against me last week. A revolutionary who, after the death of Lenin and the advent of Stalin, was in turn forced to become a wanderer over the face of the earth. I believe that history will support me when I state that Leon Trotsky has come to court with most unclean hands. He is the crystallization of Nero, Diocletian, Julian the Apostate, Ivan the Terrible, Cromwell, and Napoleon Bonaparte, the outstanding mass murderer of time and eternity. This Leon Trotsky, whose correct name is Bronstein, this most unfortunate of all possible witnesses whom my opponents could persuade to testify against me, said last week, quotations, the name of Jacob Schiff means nothing to me. If Mr. Coughlin indicated an important sum, then it must be pure invention, unquote. I should not dignify such, shall I say, such an unreliable witness as is this Bronstein with a rebuttal, lest the ghosts of his 20 million victims should rise from their resting places to assail me. Ladies and gentlemen, permit me to discuss the widely read statement issued last week by the banking firm of Kuhn, Loeb and Company, disavowing its connection with Russian revolutions in general and Mr. Jacob Schiff's financial association with them in particular. This statement appeared specifically in an early edition of the New York Times on Tuesday, November 29, and was withdrawn from the later editions of that paper on that same day. The statement, in part, reads as follows. Cohen, Lord & Company, in a statement last night, said, the firm of Cohen, Lord & Company has never had any financial relations or other relations with any government in Russia, whether Tsarist, Kerensky or communists, unquote. An additional paragraph of the same statement informs us that the late Jacob Schiff, quotation, had no relations with any fomenters of the Bolshevik uprising which destroyed the Kerensky government, being utterly out of sympathy with their methods and principles, unquote. Ladies and gentlemen, the documents to which I referred in speaking of Mr. Alexander Kerensky are pertinent to this last contention upheld by the Kuhn, Loeb and Company last Tuesday, for Mr. Jacob Schiff was the senior partner of that firm. When considering the Kuhn, Loeb and Company, we are considering a unit of that generic abstraction so often referred to as international bankers. In every nation throughout the world, the various units of this fraternity operate shuttling gold back and forth to balance exchanges, issuing credits from nation to nation, not only for productive commercial enterprises, but also for destructive and military ends. From the sunset which marked the passing of the glories that characterized the 13th century, down through the welter of wars which besmirched the pages of each succeeding age, the shadow of the international banker hovered over every battlefield, cast gloom over every home, 
and fastens the burden of death upon every innocent faith. Theirs is a fraternity which owes allegiance to no flag. Theirs is a patriotism which transcends the boundaries of every nation. For them, empires and kingdoms, principalities and republics are chessboards. With their shuffling of gold and credit, scepters fall, crowns roll in the dust, and millions of pawns victimized by purchased propaganda are claimed by death. Mammon is their god, the god of greedy gold. Internationalism is their religion, the religion of fettered slaves. The Kuhn Lord statement opens the avenues of thought which lead to such considerations. For the present members of this forum are anxious to deny any relationship to any revolution. Thus they should prove to a suspecting world that they have no relationship to the international bankers resident abroad. Kuhn Lord and Company is an international banking firm. As such, then I will refer to it when now considering the statement at issue, as well as on future occasions, if there be further need. Once more, then, I hereby refer to the British White Paper, which contains documentary evidence received from the Secret Service. The existence of this White Paper and of the reports incorporated therein cannot be brushed aside by idle denial. Last week, I telephoned to Dr. Tent Dennis Fahey at Black Rock Seminary, Dublin, Ireland, asking him to reinspect an original British white paper from which I quoted. He assures me that an original copy is still available, safely guarded, and at my disposal. And he assures me that it contains not only the references which I made to it last week, but also the excerpts from which I am about to read now in connection with the assertions issued by Kuhn and Lord and Company to the effect that neither the firm of Kuhn and Lord and Company nor any of its partners, past or present, assisted in any way to finance the communist revolution in Russia or anywhere else. Section 8 of this British white paper reads as follows. Quotations, if we bear in mind the fact that the Jewish banking house of Kuhn, Lorb and Company is in touch with the Westphalian Rhineland Syndicate, German Jewish house, and with the Brothers Lazar, Jewish house in Paris, and also with the Jewish house of Gunzburg of Petrograd, Tokyo and Paris, if in addition we remark that all the above mentioned Jewish houses are in close correspondence with the Jewish house of Spire and Company of London, New York and Frankfurt on the Main, as well as with the Naya Banken, Judeo-Bolshevik establishment at Stockholm, it will be manifest that the Bolshevik movement is, in a certain measure, the expression of a general Jewish movement, and that certain Jewish banking houses are interested in the organization of this movement." Unquote white paper. Now permit me to elaborate on this statement, which I supported with quotations from the British white paper, which was re-inspected just last week for reassurance. Let me elaborate by referring to another collection of documents known as the CISON Report. This latter collection of documents, whose authenticity is guaranteed by the National Board for Historical Service of the United States and is accepted by the United States Congress, is official. Document number 57 of the CISON Report is a circular issued on November 2nd, 1914. Among other things, it says, quotations, Zinoviev and Lunashovsky got in touch with Imperial Bank of Germany through the bankers Rubenstein, Max Warburg, and Parvis. Zinoviev addressed himself to Rubenstein and Lunashovsky through Altwater to Warburg, through whom he found support in Parvis, unquote. Here, then, the international bankers, among them a Warburg of the same family of Warburgs associated with the Kuhn Lower Bank, is one of the internationalists aiding and abetting revolution. Document 64 of this same official government report is a letter written by J. Furstenberg to Raphael Scholan on September 21, 1917. And it says, quotations, Dear Comrade, the office of the banking house, M. Warburg, has opened in accordance with telegram from President of Rhenish Westphalian Syndicate 
and account for the undertaking of Comrade Trotsky. Signed, J. Furstenberg. Of course, the world knows the relationship existing between M. Warburg and the banking house of Kuhn, Loeb & Company. The banking house which last week is reported to have said also that the late Jacob Schiff, its senior partner one day, had no relations with any fomenters of the Bolshevik uprising which destroyed the Kerensky government. The document from which I just quoted definitely relates to Trotsky's revolution against Kerensky. And it definitely indicates the activities of international bankers in fomenting communism, bankers who have intimate financial relations with the firm of Kuhn, Lord and Company. In quoting the Cezanne report, which deals with the German Bolshevik conspiracy, we read in the introduction, quotations, that the Committee on Public Information publishes herewith a series of communications between the Bolsheviks themselves and the Germans and the Bolsheviks. The documents show that the present heads of the Bolshevik government, 1918, Lenin and Trotsky and their associates, are German agents. The quotation continues to say that they show that the Bolshevik revolution was arranged for by the German great general staff, financed by the German imperial bank and other German financial institutions, unquote. However, it is perplexing to find that these so-called German bankers who dominated the government and its officials were oftentimes Jewish international bankers. Germany was their residence, but the world was their home. Now, supplementing all these documents which I have quoted, documents which I've used in helping to refute the charge of Mr. Kerensky, and the statement issued by the Cohen Loeb Banking Company of last week to the effect in the Kerensky instance that his revolution was financed not through any bankers Jewish or Gentile in America, and in the Cohen Loeb instance that the firm of Cohen Loeb and Company had no financial relations or any other relations with any government in Russia, may I produce the startling evidence of another governmental document as a refutation. It is a document published by the United States Department of State in a now rare volume entitled Papers Relating to the Foreign Relations of the United States, 1917, Supplement 2, The World War, Volume 1, page 25, file number 763-72119-5638. It reads as follows. The Secretary of State to the Ambassador in Russia, Mr. Francis. Washington, April 16, 1917, 1321. Please deliver following telegram. I'm only quoting the last two sentences. We are confident Russian Jewry are ready for the greatest sacrifices in support of the present democratic government as the only hope for the future of Russia and all its people. American Jewry holds itself ready to cooperate with the Russian brethren in this great movement. Marshall, Morgenthau, Schiff, Strauss, Rosenwald. Addressee, Milyukov, Petrograd, or Baron Gunsberg. If sent to Baron Gunsberg ad, may we ask you to submit this to your government. Signed, Lansing. My friends, Comment upon this startling document is almost unnecessary. Two names of the Cohen Loeb firm, Schiff and Strauss, are mentioned in this telegram by the Secretary of the United States, Secretary of State, Robert Lansing. But of more importance, of astounding interest, my friends, you learn from this communication that Woodrow Wilson, Secretary of State, Robert Lansing, was in this instance, and in his official capacity, the secretary of the Jewish International Bankers in helping to plot revolution with its subsequent mass murder and practice atheism. May I pause to repeat what the whole world knows, that these German financial institutions referred to in the CSUN report were dominated by international-minded Jews warmongers, 
who more than any other classification of citizens in all the world were responsible for the Holocaust of 1914-1918. One could add that they not only dominated the imperial government of Germany, but it appears they had tremendous influence in our own government. Page after page of the Overman Report, in which the CSUN report is incorporated as a government document, displays this incontrovertible fact. Alas, my friends, history will not only attribute the financing of the Bolshevik Revolution to this type of internationalist, history will become more eloquent day by day in proclaiming to posterity the part they played in manipulating the press and propaganda, in controlling public opinion, in bestirring racial and national animosities, and in unleashing the four horsemen of the apocalypse to run roughshod with their devastation over the face of civilization. Once before we fell victims to their greed for power and lust for wealth, and awakened civilization, robbing to the experience of the past 20 years, must not let history repeat itself. In passing from this point of discussion, and in face of a plenitude of evidence submitted by eminent Jews, that 65 to 75 percent of the officials of Soviet Russia are Jews who form only 2 percent of the population, what then is the purpose or where is the substantiation for Professor John W. Stanton's article, which is scheduled to appear in today's issue of the Detroit News, an article which says, quotations, to say that the Russian Revolution owes its origins to the activities of any group or foreign interests is to show only a superficial understanding of the facts underlying the forces that led to the downfall of the Romanovs and the advent of the Bolsheviks to power. Unquote. What is the purpose for making such an incorrect assertion in face of these government documents to which I have referred? Thanks be to God that the majority of Jews, poor, humble persons like the majority of Christians, played no part in this. They, as were we, were the pawns upon the checkerboard of death and persecution. These I invite to stand with us in our battle against communism and Nazism. My friends, by inviting the religious Jew and religious Gentile to join hands in assailing Nazism and communism, together with the injustices which produce the latter, I shall be castigated as one who stirreth up the multitude. Most probably I shall be scourged at the pillar in the hall of some modern Pontius Pilate. What of it? I shall continue my crusade with God's help for the humble Jew who has been the victim of persecution down the ages and for the humble Christian whose wails have remained inarticulate, cost what it may. In my effort to arouse the decent elements of America to campaign against communism as well as Nazism, in my effort to appeal to the Jewish gentlemen who have risen to such prominence in the fields of radio, the press, and the cinema, the instruments which mold our public mind, I am characterized as being an anti-Semite. An anti-Semite because I decry atheistic Jews whom Jewry officially and consistently has not repudiated. May I reiterate what I emphasized last Sunday? There is no anti-Semitic question in America. There is an anti-communist question here. And there will continue to be an anti-communist question. Veil it how you will. Until we conquer. Or until it conquers us. From it, there is no decent retreat on the part of decent Christians and decent Americans. Towards it, there is no respectable silence on the part of respectable, organized Jews. 
Thus once more I incorporate in the record of this day's speech a story told in the New York Times in reporting the meeting of the American Jewish Congress held in New York last October. Speaking of this group representing the Jews of the United States of America, the New York Times of October 31st in its story of the opening session of the American Jewish Congress said, quotation, the mention of communism threw the convention into a uproar when delegates and visitors attempted to shout down Abraham Levine, a St. Louis, Missouri delegate, who demanded that a, that a proposed declaration of the convention's principle be amended to include a denunciation of communistic theory. After heated discussion, Mr. Levine withdrew his demand, unquote. My friend, this silence towards communism, this refusal to condemn it officially on the part of this representative body of Jews is beyond explanation. A reconvention of the American Jewish Congress is in order. A reconsideration of Mr. Levine's motion is also in order. Official jury must condemn officially not only the theory but the practices of communism. Communism whose policies have crimsoned the once new river of Europe with the blood of 20 million martyrs and which is making a charnel house of the cathedrals of Spain. To the highly intelligent Jews of America who recognize these truths, do I appeal. I humbly admit your influence, gentlemen, in banking, press, and radio. And I humbly suggest for your own sake and for the sakes of the less informed members of your race, that you too will recognize that there is no anti-Semitic question in America, but that there is an anti-communist question which must be solved, a question which cannot be solved except your genius and your assets are thrown into the battle on the side of God and country. In conclusion, I plead for impartiality in governmental decisions. And impartiality which will not only strike with all its might against the injustices of Nazism in regard to the Jews, but with equal strength will utilize its majesty in behalf of the persecuted Christians abroad, victims of communism. Before me, my friends, I have an original document which Mr. Roosevelt caused to be sent to a group of refugee Ukrainians resident in our nation. Ukrainians whose homes were confiscated, whose lands and businesses and chattels were seized, and whose relatives lie rotting in the soil, either of Hungary or of the Ukraine. These men and women and little children were the victims of Bela Kuhn, whose correct name is Aaron Cohen. The atheist Jew whose communist followers woke their crimson page of disaster a few years ago, from 1922 till, quotations, this enlightened day, unquote, so referred to by our president. This original official document which Mr. Roosevelt, the president of the United States, caused to be sent to the chairman of these petitioners, reads as follows, sir, the receipt is acknowledged by reference from the White House of your telegram of December 14, 1934. Addressed to the President, urging that he intercede with the Soviet government on behalf of Ukrainians in Soviet Ukraine who are being executed without trial during the new reign of terror instituted by the Moscow government. In reply, you are informed that this government, government is not in a position to make representations to foreign governments with respect to conditions which do not directly affect American citizens or interests. Very truly yours for the Secretary of State, Robert F. Kelly Chief. God forgive us. No intervention for Ukrainians and Hungarians, victims of Aaron Cohen, whose bodies now fertilize the golden wheat fields of mid-Europe. But a plenitude of intervention and publicity for the Jews, 
not one of whom has been officially murdered. May the Holy Trinity infuse into the minds of our rulers a spirit of justice, of fairness, both to Christian and Jew, and if necessary, a spirit of militancy against the communists, both at home and abroad, whom up to this present moment, this government has been protecting, aiding, and abetting, both by its silence, its cooperation, and its criminal good neighborliness. Good afternoon, my friend. gentlemen, you have listened to one of the most outstanding addresses delivered from the microphone of the Shrine of the Little Flower. Next week, Father Coughlin will be heard over these same stations, provided you are willing to support him in the presentation of these programs, which are paid for at full commercial rates. This is your program, not his. This is America's program, America comprised of Jew and Gentile, Christian and non-Christian. Please advertise this presentation, which we hope to make the most worthwhile hour on the air. And please write a letter to Father Coughlin this week to give him moral courage to carry on and to request a copy of this discourse to which you have just listened. We ask those who have written in last week for copies to be patient, if as yet they have not received their copy. Our mail is tremendous. Our staff is working overtime. This week at the latest, your copy will be in your hands. Sunday afternoon. This is your announcer, Franklin Mitchell, again bidding you on behalf of Father Coughlin, good afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, we have presented the regular Sunday afternoon address of Father Charles E. Coughlin from Royal Oak, Michigan. The thoughts and opinions contained in this address were entirely those of the speaker and in no way reflect the policies of this station. We invite you to write your comments to WHBI, Newark, New Jersey. Your dial is set at 1,250 kilocycles. WHBI, Hoyt Brothers Incorporated, Newark, New Jersey. <laughs>